Hello, I am Johnny Diamond and welcome to World Questions. Mexico's first ever female president has swept to power with a landslide victory. As she takes office, we're debating the many challenges she faces with questions from Mexicans across their vast country. Mexico bridges north and south, east and west, rich and poor. Its vast agricultural spaces matched only by its enormous capital, Mexico City, one of the world's megalopolises. Resource rich and packed with human talent, it's now a big international economic player, a manufacturer to the Americas, a global trendsetter. But it's also a place where affluence is blighted by extreme poverty and where drug manufacture, transit and export have become embedded. Corruption has a grip on so much of the country and many Mexican cities are amongst the most dangerous in the world. The federal police has been replaced with a militarised force and the independent appointed judiciary has been scrapped. Mexico will now elect nearly all of its judges. As President Claudia Scheinbaum takes office, she issued 100 promises of soaring ambition. To debate Mexico's future, I'm joined by Federal Deputy Arturo Avila, the spokesperson for the governing Morena Party in the Chamber of Deputies and part of its leadership team. Denise Dresser, a writer and professor of political science at Instituto Tecnologico Autónomo de Mexico. Vanessa Romero, an independent legal consultant and writer. And until the election this summer, Jorge Triana was a deputy leader of the largest opposition party, PAN, in the Chamber of Deputies. That's our panel. Let's go to our first question. Mexico has its first female president. Does that provide an opportunity for a new diplomatic, political and financial relationship with the USA, whichever candidate wins the presidential election? I am a Mexican immigrant to the US, now legal, and I would like to see better relations. That question from Patty, read, as I say, by a member of the production team. Arturo Avila from the governing party. Um, a new president, a new relationship with the US, a relationship currently perhaps dominated by drugs and crime, trade and illegal migration. Is there new things on the horizon? Yes, Johnny, how are you? First of all, thank you for letting us be there with you. Uh, let me tell you that in Mexico, we're living a new political phase, which we call it the fourth transformation. And also let me tell you that this is a very peaceful revolution that seeks to put an end to the corrupt government that favored the richest and created in the history of Mexico an enormous inequality. It wasn't until now that Mexico managed to lift 9.5 million people out of poverty. And this is data according to the World, to the World Bank data. And of course, we started to reduce the violence, which was caused by the government represented by uh, uh, the, the action of uh, the Pan Party, uh, the one that is represented here by the ex-deputy Triana. We achieved history with our first female president after 200 years of Mexican Republic. And the first woman, by the way, of North America with Claudia Sheinbaum, all women arrive. And of course, talking about immigration, we're basically taking care of it. As you may know, no one, no one that is immigrating for another country does it or the challenge of immigration, it's rooted by a fundamental belief. No one that migrates uh, to another country do it for pleasure. Migrants represent a humanitarian issue. I understand, I understand all that, but I want to bring you to the question in particular, which was yeah. about the relationship with the United States, whether having a new female president will change that relationship for the better and, of course, dependent on the result of that election. We do have a good relation with the United States, of course. It's our more important uh, partner, social partner. We have a free trade with not just with the United States, with Canada, but there's something different in the, in the policy that we're applying. In the past, the PAN and the PRI, which uh, they represent, they used to subordinate to the US government. And now, in fact, we want to coordinate. And this is completely different. We, have, we want to have respect from them because we're a sovereign country. And with, this, with these principles, we can change our relation. Never more, never more, we're going to be the backyard of the United States. Never more. That's the best 
Now we're going to coordinate relations at the same level with this country. And that's very important to say. OK, thank you very much indeed. Denise Dresser, um, academic and writer, the question about whether or not having a first female president might change the relationship with your neighbour to the north. Well, first of all, I would disagree with a lot of what uh, the representative of the ruling party has just said. His is a political statement, and there's a big difference between rhetoric and reality. I celebrate the arrival of the woman, of a first woman to the presidency to Mexico. But at the same time, I would question whether uh, Mexico's democracy is going to survive what is called the fourth transformation, something you mentioned in your introduction. Mm. Um, the judiciary is now going to be elected, basically controlled by the ruling party. And there are many other changes that have occurred, dismantling of checks and balances and uh, a party winning with a supermajority that has allowed it to now reform the Constitution entirely on its own, taking Mexico back to a regressive period in its history when it was dominated by basically one party rule. In terms of U.S.-Mexico relations, these have been strained times over the past presidency of Andrés Manuel López Obrador. Strained because Mexico has been unable to control issues of violence and criminality. And the, the Biden administration was very concerned throughout this time that López Obrador was engaged not, al not only in democratic backsliding, but did not have a policy of combating criminality and drug trafficking in a clear strategic way. Now, I think the reason relations have not been so overtly strained as in the past is because Mexico, in effect, has acted as the U.S.'s backyard. Uh, Lopez Obrador made a pact with Donald Trump when he was in the presidency, and that pact has continued, that the U.S. would be silent on what happened in Mexico in terms of democratic erosion, as long as Mexico acted as a de facto border wall and kept immigrants from crossing into the U.S. Immigration today is the biggest issue in the U.S. election. So um, I don't foresee a major change in relations as long as immigration becomes the key issue that the U.S. wants to put at, at the forefront of its relations with Mexico. Denise, thank you very much indeed. Jorge Triana from the Opposition Pan Party. The, the question about a change or an improvement in relations with the U.S., with the, your election in Mexico and their election come November? OK, let's talk about the relations between Mexico and USA. During the administration of President López Obrador, more than 3 million Mexicans crossed our northern border to the United States, which is a 196% increase compared to the administration of Peña Nieto. Donald Trump claimed he bent López Obrador with the Remain in Mexico program, that's the name, forcing him to deploy 28,000 Mexican soldiers to our border. We become the U.S. Border Patrol. That's incredible. Shame faces the enormous challenge of the bending to either Trump or Kamala Harris. Both candidates have taken a harsh and toothless stance on migration. What we expect is for our president to defend the rights of Mexicans both within and outside Mexico. I hear Arturo laughing. Uh, hello, Mr. Arturo. <laughs> yes, of course, I'm laughing because you guys are always lying. You, the, the pan-political party and the pre-political party, they're experts in lying. Let's go to history. Um, he should remember because uh, Pan, from his political party, was president of Mexico when he declared this war against uh, drug okay. cartels. We, we, we will, we will, we will have time to to, to yeah. debate to yeah. discuss this. Um, um, I want to know. Do you want to just finish up? Just to say, Arturo, 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 please. We haven't even yeah. heard from Vanessa yet, <laughs> so I want to hear from her. But Jorge, do you want to finish your point as to the relationship with the United States, and then we can thank you. at least get round all our panelists? Yeah, thank you. We'll finish. Uh, Lopez Obrador uh, release of video Guzman shows deference to the mothers of the Chapo Guzman, exonerates Cienfuegos, General Cienfuegos, pardons Villanueva Madrid and exchanges letters with Felix Gallardo, the, the uh, drug dealer in Mexico. There, is, there are dozens of articles in reports in international media that document his relationship with drug trafficking. 
Keep laughing, Mr. Arturo. Okay, okay. Let's try and stick, if we can, for the moment, at any rate, to this first question and the relationship with the United States. I'll keep laughing. Um, and you keep laughing if you want to, Arturo. Uh, Vanessa Romero, independent legal consultant and writer. What do you make of the relationship now and what do you think the chances of improvement are? Uh, I think the um, relationship between the US and Mexico is likely to be more diplomatic because based on two things. First of all, because Shane Moment has been strategic in appointing only men to lead the key ministry that will lead you with Trump mm -hmm. if he wins. Mm -hmm. Juan Ramon de la Fuente, who will have the foreign ministry with extensive diplomatic negotiation experience, and Marcelo Ebrard, who will lead the Ministry of Economy and has already negotiated the um, the US MCA in the past with mm -hmm. Trump. Uh, based on that and on gender evidence that suggests that women, we tend to govern with a more diplomatic approach and focus on achieving better results. Um, well, it's widely known that uh, various studies have shown that female leaders often prioritize dialogue, cooperation, inclusivity in their polities. Um, I think we will have a uh, way more better relationship with the US than Vanessa, we have. Vanessa, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's go on to our second question. Uh, it comes from Paula Ponce. Um, Paula, can you hear me? Yes. OK, let's hear your question. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm a judicial advisor, and my job is to advise federal court judges on sentencing. So I have been involved in the debates about how they are appointed. Can you reassure me that judicial reform does not risk a dictatorship in Mexico by giving the party in power too much control? Thank you very much, Paula. Um, uh, Paula, a judicial advisor, asks about the sweeping reforms that have been brought in in Mexico, affecting 7,000 judges all of whom were previously appointed, nearly all of whom will now be elected. A very controversial move by the governing party and one confirmed by the incoming president. Jorge Triana from the opposition PAN party. Sure. Um, judicial reform, does it risk a dictatorship in Mexico by giving the party in power too much control is from the questioner. Yeah, OK. I convinced it that the judicial reform is necessary. There is no doubt that corruption exists among judges and magistrates. However, the reform proposed by the government does not solve any of these problems and violates the principle of judicial independence and the separation of powers. On the reform, citizens will be able to elect their judges, but the list of candidates will be decided by the government. This represents a direct interference by the executive and legislative branches in the judiciary. It is contrary to human rights. Impartial judges will be no longer exist and they will become political militants of the ruling party. Terrible. The reform's sole intention is to accumulate power in the hands of the president. This is authoritarianism. Thank you very much, Jorge. Um, uh, Vanessa Romero, you're a lawyer yourself as well as a, a writer. Do you agree that these are reforms risk a dictatorship and that hand the governing party too much power? Well, I've been open and loud about my views on the judicial reform, both, as you say, as a lawyer and also as an analyst. Yeah. I think implementing this reform comes with serious challenges, as Jorge says, especially since it involves selecting a large number of positions. And also because there's hardly any global precedent suggesting that this approach will work for Mexico. That said, if Mexico managed to do, to do it, to, if, he, if this uh, is a successful reform, it could set a global example on how direct democracy can keep the judiciary in check. Also, it is important to acknowledge that the judiciary before the reform was in a terrible state. It was corrupt, influenced by economic and corporate power, the organized crime, and also without a real disciplinary system in place. Critics also argue, as a um, professional is um, saying her question, mm -hmm. that direct elections will comprise the judiciary's impartiality. But the truth is that impartiality was already questionable in the previous judiciary. 
Thank you very much indeed. Denise Dresser, um, academic and writer, um, there's been huge controversy over these reforms, um, but um, looking back from before the reforms, there was huge controversy about the judiciary and a great deal of distrust from the Mexican population in the judges themselves. What do you make of the reforms? Well, it's clear that we had issues with the judiciary of nepotism, of corruption. However, as um, as has been the case throughout the entire period of Lopez Obrador, there was a gap between the perfect, a good diagnostic of what was happening and then a very bad solution to the problem. Going very quickly back to relations with the US, imagine the, the following scenario. Donald Trump wins in the US election. He wins a supermajority. With that, he reforms the constitution so that all of the judges, ministers of the Supreme Court, and everyone, all of the judges who um, who, uh, who, who take care of conflicts, who are to addre address post-electoral conflicts, are elected by the people. No one in the world would hesitate to say that that would be the end of American democracy as we know it, because it would mean control of the judiciary by one party that is in the government. It would mean the end of the separation of powers. So I think this poses a huge risk for Mexico moving forward. Even if we got the details right, the enormity of the task, it is ludicrous. It would take each citizen of Mexico approximately four hours to vote for 7,000 judges, including ministers of the Supreme Court, and the candidates would be proposed by the presidency and by the legislative powers already controlled by Morena. So I see this as a power grab, and it's going to create problems for Mexico. Imagine being an investor who wants to invest in Mexico because of everything you mentioned in the introduction. Uh, it's geographical proximity. It's talented people. Would you invest in a country that has no rule of law? OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, Arturo Avila, uh, government spokesperson. Um, one phrase leapt out there, um, and it from Denise Dresser in particular, control of the judiciary by one party in the government. Do you dispute that interpretation of what the reform will bring? Yes, of course, because the, the Constitution, as it was, will allow the president, if they want it, if they were not agree on the Senate, for example, to put directly the people from the Supreme Court. What the reform proposes is something that no one could oppose to. Let me tell you, there's... Well, hang on, three, hang on, hang on, sorry. The US ambassador has no. already opposed it, as has Canada's ambassador, in very straightforward no, no, let terms. Me, let me tell you, let me tell you, who can oppose to this? Austerity. We, we say that there cannot be wealthy government with poor population. And currently, we have ministers earning, listen to this, please, half, almost half million dollars per year. This will change with the new reform. There are 202,000 persons working right now in the judiciary, earning more than the president, earning a hundred more times than the minimum wage. You can imagine that in a, in a place like Mexico. The other thing that it's important to say is we're looking forward to stop the conflict of interest. A disciplinary court will be created. Well, it's created right now, of course, will be created with the new constitution that will allow the actions of judges to be judged, judged by judges elected democratically. Because right now, they judge themselves. That's amazing. We will have strict requirements, such as proven honesty, good academic standards, being recognized individuals, and being elected by a selection committees. OK, um, Paola Pons, you have pretty deep experience of the judicial system. My guess is you oppose the reforms. But what have you heard and, and what would you comment? Well, I agree with Denise because I consider that judicial reform is bad for justice in Mexico since it puts checks and balances at risk. And the elected judges will not have the necessary experience, preparation and professionalization, as had been the case until now with the judicial career system. Let's go to our next question. It comes from Raquel, again, because of the sensitivity, we're maintaining her anonymity and it's read by a member of the production team. Until recently, I lived in the state of Veracruz, where a lot of drugs pass through to the Gulf of Mexico. It has the most mass graves and illegal burials in the country and criminal violence is now routine. 
I feared for my safety every day, so I left the country. We are on the bridge of a huge societal tragedy in Mexico. What does the panel think could change things and make it safe enough for me to come home? That question from Raquel. Um, uh, Mexicans must tire of, of hearing about the crime in their own country. Uh, for those that are not aware, there are 85 murders a day, according to government figures, That's six times higher than its northern neighbour, than the United States. And there are those who say that those figures are on the rather low side. Um, Jorge Triana from the opposition PAN party. The, the question, what does the panel think could change things and make it safe for me to come home? The first I have to say is that in any case, Lopez Obrador government has been the most violent and bloodiest in Mexico's modern history. We are talking about 200,000 violent homicides, 72,000 unidentified bodies, 52,000 missing persons. We need police uh, uh, by the training of civilians, not military sides. This is the fact. We will come on to the question of militarization yeah. uh, in the next in the next question. Arturo Avila, f- uh, spokesperson for the government. Basically, Claudia Sheinbaum is introducing the new strategy of uh, safety. We recognize that that's an issue that we need to attend, but we also seem to get results with our government, and we need to uh, to first ask Joni what happened in Mexico. Why did our country fall apart? What was this phenomenon that causes this? And let me tell you real briefly, Felipe Calderón declared war against drug cartels. War against drug cartels. The, the former this president, president declared president war against drug cartels. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's correct. He allowed the entry of weapons, which is recognized. These arms went directly to the criminals. He sent the army out of the barracks without any strategy. There was the real militarization. Meanwhile, the person, Johnny, in charge of the country, security, was an ally of the Chapo Guzman. This Lord Cartel, Lopez Obrador, is achieving for the first time in nearly 20 years a downward trend in homicides. And this is important to say. Today, the causes of insecurity we also or, or we are also addressed. Why? Because we kept out of the poverty more than 9.5 million people. And this is uh, the World Bank data. The National Guard currently has 130,000 deployed members. So we're doing things, new things. We're doing things that are giving results for Mexicans. Thank you very much indeed, Arturo. Um, Vanessa Romero, um, the policy of the government, which continues, of course, under the new presidency, was described as what hugs, not bullets. Do you agree with Arturo that the direction of travel is the right one? I cannot agree with this propagandistic view that says that it was only hugs and not be- not bullets. I mean, the National Guard uh, was all over the country. Mm. I agree with Arturo that AMLO's strategic um, view hasn't failed, but its results are so minimal that they don't provide people with the security they need to feel they can return to their own country. Uh, on that way, I'm optimistic on Claudia Sheinbaum's plan that will mainly focus on addressing root reasons for crime, second, to consolidate the National Guard on the Ministry of Defense, strengthen intelligence and investigation efforts, which was that what Claudia Sheinbaum did in Mexico City with very good results. Thank you very much indeed. indeed. Uh, Denise Dresser, academic and writer, the, the question... Uh, what could change things and make it safe for the questioner to come home? This administration that is leaving uh, has put the country in probably its worst security situation ever. It is the most violent term in the past 18 years. And yet this stems from failed policies of three consecutive administrations that declared a war on drugs and tried to solve it by taking the military out into the streets. We can talk about those implications later, but there is a correlation between the military in the streets and an increase in violence. 
We are now witnessing dramatic events in Guerrero, in, in Sinaloa. The mayor of, Chilpan, of, of Chilpancingo was recently decapitated. So insecurity is an issue that three administrations put on the back burner. Lopez Obrador's concern was alleviating poverty, and he did so, and that is to be celebrated. But at the expense of not having a coherent security strategy. Um, very briefly, Vanessa Romero. Yeah, I cannot agree with Denise that this is the worst moment for security in the country. Just in the last three years, last three years of the president of the previous president, Enrique Peña Nieto, homicides tripled, rising from 20,000 to 37,000 annually. And that curve was flattened by AMLO's administration. So in being honest, we cannot say that this is the worst moment for security in the country. OK, thank you. AMLO is, of course, an abbreviation for López Obrador, Obrador, the former president. Thank you very much. Let's go to our next question. It comes from Ale. When I was living in Monterrey, uh, they brought in the military and Navy to deal with criminals. There were shootings on the streets. A woman in my neighborhood was killed during a chase. And the day before, two, two innocent students were killed uh, on their way back from, from uh, the library. And it took them years to get some justice. Now, who is going to protect the people's rights from a uh, militarized police force since it has its own courts and tribunals? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ale. Thank you very much for your question and for giving us that background as well on the situation. The federal police are now the National Guard. 80% of them are drawn from the Army and the Navy with different training and, of course, different lines of accountability. It's another hugely controversial topic. Um, Denise Dresser, academic and writer, um, do you agree um, that if the military has its own rules, its own courts, it's much harder for citizens to get justice? Absolutely. And I'm so glad that she mentioned the case of Jorge and Javier, two young students who were chased into uh, the university where they studied and were killed there. This is what happens when you have the military taken out into the streets to perform uh, tasks that should be dealt with with a civilian police force. The militarization of Mexico has been the most dramatic change that the country has experienced. And it, it has been strengthened and consolidated by Lopez Obrador before he left office. He left its legacy to Claudia Sheinbaum, who insists that there is no militarization. When, if you look at the numbers, over 180 tasks that were in civilian hands, including control of airports, ports, immigration policy, these are tasks, many of which no democracy would put in the hands of the military because you're creating a de facto political and economic power. And in Mexico, it has no civilian oversight. A recent constitutional change put the National Guard under the control of the Ministry of Defense. Uh, our questioner was absolutely right. They have their own rules, their own discipline, their own hierarchy, and their own courts. So if someone uh, repeats what happened in Monterrey today, shoots a civilian, he will be tried in a military court. And that basically means exoneration. So this is the long-term problem with militarizing public security. Uh, it undermines checks and balances. There's no accountability. There's no transparency. There is no civilian oversight. And one of the reason me reasons Mexico never went through the Latin American dictatorships that plagued other countries in the 1970s and 80s is because we had a very small military always under civilian control. Thank you very much indeed. Arturo, Arturo Avila, spokesperson for the government in the Chamber of Deputies. Uh, lack of accountability, transparency, oversight, getting the military to do jobs that civilians should be doing. Why, why is so much now militarised within Mexico? I think it's wrong, the, 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 using the word militarised. A few days ago, as, as you know, we reformed the Constitution as deputies to consolidate the powers of the National Guard, including investigative powers and to attach it to the Ministry of Defense, to Sedena. Now, this has been used by the opposition to accuse us of militarization, which is completely, completely false. Well, it's hardly surprising they're accusing the you of militarization when you connect 
the primary national police force, not to the Interior Ministry, but to the Ministry of Defence. I mean, that is militarisation, isn't it? Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of examples in the world, such as Italy, France, Chile and Spain, uh, that make the most of their army. We take the most of the army, which in our country, let me tell you, is the one, one of the institutions that people trust the most. So right now, the National Guards, the National Guard uh, currently deploys more than 120,000 personnel across the country. Uh, we plan to distribute a total of 150,000 according to the plan of President Claudia Sheinbaum goals. And the National Guard is now the largest security force uh, that Mexico has ever had. Right now, the National Guard is already specializing in human rights and, of course, in police focused so to, of, to citizen security. OK, thank you very much indeed. Vanessa Romero, uh, a lawyer yourself and a writer. Um, the question, of course, was about whether or not it is harder for citizens to get justice under the current system. Do you believe it is? Well, in theory, according to the wording of the law, if a member of the National Guard commits a crime or violates human rights, they should be tried in civilian courts. It is true that the current law, it is not absolutely clear that the National Guard personnel will be subject to civilian jurisdiction. So this must be explicitly addressed in secondary legislation uh, that shall be passed in uh, the future date. Now, uh, talking about security, I do think that the National Guard will be a military entity in the sense that its personnel will come from armed forces, even through the even though their training, the training they will pass through will be focused on law enforcement. In terms of, of hierarchy and structure, it is a military body. Vanessa, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, let's hear from um, uh, Jorge Triana uh, from the uh, opposition PAN party on this issue. This is a tragedy. Today, the military is building and managing ports, airports, customs, and even hotels and supermarkets. They act as intermediaries for the construction of railways and road repairs and without any transparency. The government is militarizing the National Guard. We need well-trained civilian police forces at the state and municipal levels, not militarism. Militarism is not the right path. Thank you very much, um, all of you. A very divisive subject, clearly. Uh, Ale, what did you make of what you heard? You obviously had concerns about what is described as the militarisation of the police. What did you make of the defence of it? Clearly, they, they will tell us they are they are not uh, militarizing the the national guard uh, i have been watching uh, the news and they keep saying they keep saying that but the military are the same they haven't changed is it is it very different for you if you meet or you interact with members of the National Guard? Is it, is it clear to you? Do they feel like they are from the military or does it seem like a, a, a more like a police force? How is it? Well, I, um, I had some, some uh, National Guard uh, telling me to, to, mo to move my car from, uh, from the airport, mm. but clearly I, 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 it didn't feel like a police officer. It felt more like uh, soldier telling me, um, and I should be. I, I I didn't feel safe. Ale, thank you very much indeed. Diana, your question to our panel. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, last year, I graduated from UNAM, the best university in the country. My degree was in theater studies. I have not managed to find any work in my chosen career, and neither have my friends who qualified in different subjects. The only graduates I know who have got employment in their chosen profession are people with good connections and fathers or mothers who are somebodies. I come from an ordinary family with no connections and I travel four hours every day to get to my university. What can be done to create equal career opportunities based on merit for young people? 
Diana, thank you so much for your questions. It's really good to hear your own personal story as well. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's almost two questions there. One is about connections and nepotism and using those, but the other is about um, high rates of, undergrad, of, of graduate unemployment. One third of graduates are without a job and nearly half of those who have graduated are doing jobs unrelated to their studies. Vanessa Romero, lawyer and writer, um, how hard is it for graduates um, and how important are connections, who you know, uh, rather than what you've got? Well, in fact, it is very important in Mexico, not only for the judiciary, but in almost every kind of job, to know someone to get into that um, employment. This was something that um, AMLO maybe did not t took care of it under his government because he did not prioritize uh, technology, science, education, and that uh, Claudia Sheinbaum has already emphasized her commitment to improving science, technology, by focusing on several key areas. Uh, first, she says she plans to increase public investment. In fact, she has made a new Ministry of Science, Technology and Education, trying to ensure that more resources are allocating to this type of um, professions, uh, especially taking into consideration that Claudia Sheinbaum is herself an UNAM graduate. A graduate the of the same university as Diana, yeah. our questioner. Right. Um, yeah. And that she aims to strengthen collaboration between uh, universities, research institutions and the private sector or so she says. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Denise Dresser, this, this question about graduates and, and the lack of jobs for them. It's so trying for so many economies, but the numbers here are very high. It's a question I get all the time from my students. I've been a university professor for many years, and this is a long-standing problem. And it has to do basically with a country that does not grow enough innovate enough or create enough opportunities for its young people. In the past administration, there was an important focus on equality, but not an important focus on creating opportunities for young people. Lopez Obrador frequently made fun of the middle classes, of doctors, of scientists, of people who disagreed with his views and said that uh, everyone should live through, through uh, uh, via Franciscan poverty, uh, which, in other words, translated into the government giving out social benefits to the poor, but forgetting about the rest of the population that is actually seeking a more dynamic, inclusive place. So I hope that the focus that uh, Claudia Sheinbaum has suggested, repeated by Vanessa, on science, on technology, also on the humanities, and understanding that good governance is not just about addressing inequality and that it's also about creating opportunity and growth and trampolines for social mobility. I think that sadly Mexico has been a country of nepotism, of connections, of crony capitalism, and I think we have to change the way in which we provide opportunities for the young. Denise, thank you very much indeed. Um, Jorge Triana. I think the answer is in entrepreneur. Uh, we need to prize the entrepreneurship with more companies created by young people. That's a fact. And today we have one of the lowest rates of new business creation in Latin America and also lack in new uh, patents. I hope the new president changed that situation. But we need more entrepreneurship and more well-paid jobs for young people. Thank you so much. Um, uh, um, uh, Arturo Avila. As well, Jody, I will say that we have two issues, right? The first issue, it's on government because the nepotism you have it on government. And let me tell you, there's a huge example about nepotism in the judiciary system. Let me give you some data. It's amazing. Four of 10 people that worked on the judiciary system that we reform, they were relatives of judge. Also, in the other side, Mexico is closing the government of uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador and opening the government of Claudia Sheinbaum with the best economical, economical indicators that we have in a long time. And we're helping the youth with this initiative that it's called Youth Building the Future. We have supported over 3 million young people and helping them a lot to get into employment. And yet somehow, somehow over the past few years, growth 
has been really low. Why is that? Growth. Why has growth, growth been so growth low? Growth has been really low in the world. We have COVID. We have wars in the world. I mean, it's a phenomenon. So Mexico is doing really good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jorge, you wanted to make a point. Very quickly, uh, that's curious. Lopez Obrador proposed to the Supreme Court the sister of the Secretary of the Interior, Luisa Maria Alcalde, who holds the highest position in the presidential cabinet, alone managed to place at least seven of her relatives in high-ranking government position. Nepotism and cronism, uh, it's a very big problem in Mexico with this government. Thank you very much. Diana, I want to come to you, if I may. Um, you've heard a lot of different opinions. You clearly feel very strongly about this question about connections and about the need for connections if you're going to get a job. You've come up against it yourself. You feel it yourself, do you, this, this barrier to getting a job? Uh, yes, I feel the barrier, but also I agree that there are uh, different opportunities like in Jóvenes Escribiendo el Futuro, but sometimes I feel a little bit uh, like I don't have the opportunities. It's, just, it's, it's weird, like being a graduate and don't know where to, to, to who to rely on, to my family, to my professors, to the, the government. My school, I don't know. Diana, thank you so much for your question and sharing some of your story with us. Um, it's lovely to have you on the programme. Let's go to our next question. It comes from Oscar. Bullfighting is still common here and it symbolises the Mexican violence. Uh, we are the macho guys and I think it needs to, to change. So my question is, now that we have a first female president, is there any possibility to stop Bill fighting once and for all. Thank you I think very much. It's a simple question, but it's, it's it a is a sim it is a simple question. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see if it can maintain its simplicity in the answers. Second most popular spectator <laughs> sport <laughs> after football in Mexico, prohibited in I think five out of the thirty-one states. But recently, a ban on bullfighting in Mexico City was overturned. Um, Arturo Avila from the governing party is bullfighting safe under. Um, the new government? Well, where I come from, I was called this bullfighting is recognized as cultural heritage of, human of humanity and is actually a cultural significant tradition. However, the issue of bullfighting often sparks extreme opinions. While some view it as a cultural heritage, others see it as an animal abuse. I firmly believe that animal cruelty must be condemned in all circumstances. It's important to note that the level of animal abuse is often more severe than what occurs in bullfighting. Nevertheless, I acknowledge that we need to engage in serious discussions about both sides of the argument. For those who oppose bullfighting on ethical grounds, I suggest they also consider the condition, which can be the slaughterhouses that also can be terrible. So in our, Azure, in our legislative agenda, we will propose a law to prevent animal abuse and to ensure that animals are treated as sentient beings. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Yeah. We're going to leave it there. I said you had to be short good, good. on this one. Oh, hey, okay, Triana. I was, I oh, hey, sure. Triana from the opposition party. <laughs> I want to express my particular point of view. The banning of bullfighting what has processed in Mexico and fewer people see it as a cultural issue. Uh, bad news, one of the main bullfighting businessmen in Mexico is a Morena Party congressman. That's a fact. Judges have uh, granted several injunctions that have to put a stop this practice at last in Mexico City. Uh, regress and suffering uh, inflicted to animal and the uh, barbarity of turning such a bloody act okay, into Okay, what do you treatment. think? What, what do you think personally? Do you but think bullfighting should okay. stay or, or should stop? I think uh, we have uh, no bullfighting. No, no bullfighting. bullfighting. Thank you very I'm, much. I'm against bullfighting. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Denise Dresser, academic and writer. Are you a fan of bullfighting? I am not. I think that it should end. I have no idea what the incoming president's position is on this issue. I do want to take Arturo Avila up on his uh, promise to debate this issue. Uh, I wish that the ruling party showed that kind of vocation and willingness to debate um, how to protect the rights of humans 
political rights, civil rights, and many issues that should be up for debate and have been just subjected to impositions from a majoritarian party that okay. doesn't really understand that democracy is about debate, it's about consensus, and it's about pluralism. You have very Thank successfully you. twisted a question about bullfighting into a broader one <laughs> about the democratic <laughs> polity. Congratulations. <laughs> Last word to Vanessa Romero, a lawyer and writer. Vanessa, bullfighting, yes well, or no? Personally, I am against bullfighting. I have attended, and I can see that there are cultural aspects worth uh, preserving. Yeah. Uh, currently, I do not see uh, a straight vision of Claudia Shema on this. I think there is no official proposal, or I haven't heard of it, or from Morena or Claudia Shema to ban bull fighting. Uh, however, she has a uh, promise to expand protection against animal cruelty. So we might see something on this issue in the near future. That is it for World Questions Mexico. A big thank you to our panel and all the questioners that contributed to this debate. I'm Johnny Diamond. Goodbye.